Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a huge pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a global view on human wildlife conflicts. That's kind of my background to this. I've been working on conflicts around the world for nearly 20 years. Um, and so I'm going to be coming to this topic very much from a, a global overarching attempted view and also very much from an applied view. I'm very interested in how we make these uh, coexistences work, how we mitigate these conflicts in the real world. And so what springs straight to notice is the fact that human wildlife conflicts around the world are an issue of great urgency globally. Um, in fact, becoming more and more, uh, gaining more and more international attention along with the other major issues in conservation. Um, the trouble is that every case of conflict is completely different from the next. This is a giant challenge for us there is not very much we can transfer from one to another directly, and I'll talk more about this. And the third is that con uh, conflicts are immensely complex, um, which is what we've seen throughout this conference, and everybody is trying to grapple with the complexity of dealing with humans. And so what I'm really very interested in is trying to figure out what does it take in the real world to actually mitigate these, to understand the, the essentials of what we need to know to then mitigate these effectively. And so it is really becoming a global huge priority. If you look at just, for example, the tiger range outside of protected areas, this is the red here, not in protected areas, outside of protected areas, and the black and gray is livestock distribution. You can immediately see what a problem this is going to be for tigers and that we absolutely have to do something about this quickly. The jaguar range, for example, from Mexico to Argentina, make it out on the slide. Um, if you overlap onto that the uh, cattle density, this is what it looks like. If you put on top of that protected areas, you immediately see that 64% of the jaguar range is outside of protected areas. So human wildlife conflict has to be figured out and dealt with if we're going to save jaguars. In fact, for jaguars, the Conflict is probably the number one threat to the species because it is everywhere and it is in places very acute. And the problem with the jaggers is that the vast majority of conflicts are right at the edges of protected areas and that basically this creates ecological traps. So let's say you have a protected area with jaggers in it and you have a very attractive resource right outside that protected area, easy prey, perhaps even a lack of natural prey in the protected area to exacerbate that. And of course, jaguars are going to go for that. And of course, people are going to retaliate. And you end up drawing out that population faster than some other threat, like habitat loss, might um, kill off these jaguars. And what you end up with is local extinctions of the species due to this conflict. And you can imagine if you scale that up, and it happens quite rapidly in a lot of places, this can become a very sudden and serious threat for the species. The other serious issue in human wildlife conflict that we've not really begun to tackle yet is that of emerging conflicts where we have so-called successes. So where we have either um, uh, species naturally coming back or we have managed to protect a species effectively like, for example, tigers in Nepal. They've had huge success protecting these. And for example, in Chitwan National Park, there's now around 170 tigers and this has caused a crisis of human wildlife conflict around the edges and in the buffer zones of the park. Um, similarly with the gear lion, um, it's a small population that only exists in that part of India, but it is doing, it, it is there, it's, it's grown, and the local population has to live with these lions, and we have to actually anticipate these situations a whole lot better as we carry out our um, species recovery work. Now, I said every case of human wildlife conflict is different from the next. I think probably everybody who works on these things on the ground uh, can identify with that. If you were to look just at jaggers, for example, we did this huge study a few years ago looking at jagger conflicts across the range using expert opinion, actual field studies on the ground, all the literature, and we were really trying to find any kind of consistent predictor of tolerance or acceptance of jaggers in all sorts of different socioeconomic situations. 
and looked at everything from social norms to, to economic risk and the history and all sorts of things and basically found absolutely no pattern. So once you really zoom out and you look at conflicts across four species across an entire continent and you look for patterns case by case, it turns out there aren't any. So it's basically telling us that we have to treat every case individually um, and that means you have to because there's so many of them and we have a shortage of resources and time, we basically have to become very good at analyzing a situation very rapidly and then knowing what to do. And so, for example, in these many Jagger cases that we analyzed, we did find patterns. You know, for example, um, tolerance would be connected to how rooted a population was in that area, how many generations have been there, but only in, for example, here, three case studies not in the other, we did 17 in total. So in three case studies, it was strongly significant and in 14, it was not. And this is what we're finding over and over. And it just reminds us to be really careful about generalizing from our case study work. Um, it's very tempting to do that, especially when the results are very convincing, but every case is simply different. Then of course, con uh, conflicts are extremely complex. We're dealing here with everything from emotions to power to, to the economics and security and politics. And so this is where, obviously, biology is not going to get us very far, which is why we have conferences like this, because we're trying to get a grip of these things. Um, in this audience, I think everybody understands that human-wildlife conflicts are actually human, human conflicts about wildlife. Um, I think this is very obvious to everyone in this room because of the backgrounds that we have coming into this forum. It, however, uh, in the vast majority of conservation practitioner world, many of whom come from an ecology or biology background, this, this is almost still disputed. There are people who are uncomfortable with this, and so this is something we still need to understand across the entire uh, scientific discipline much better. I've, there are some examples that just illustrate the illogical complexity of some of these situations. For example, this is um, a beehive in the uh, Mato Grosso of Brazil, and it's about that high, and giant armadillos will go on their hind legs, knock it over, and then eat all the larvae. Um, and so you could say that there's a very simple solution here. All you need to do is raise the beehive, right? So they can't reach it. Um, however, the local uh, beekeepers and farmers don't want to do that because for practical reasons. It's much easier to just stand on the back of your pickup truck and you can reach the top of the, the stack of, uh, uh, of the hive and service it and so on. But once you dig into it, actually what's going on here is there's a superstition. They believe that these creatures are extremely bad luck. They don't want them anywhere near their farm or their house. And so they're, they don't actually want to have a solution to this. And yet, if you go straight into this with a very rational scientific solution, oh, well, let's just do this. No wonder it's not going to be accepted and it's not going to work. Um, conversely, we have situations where there is disproportionately high tolerance of species. The gear lions are amazingly tolerated given that people get killed, livestock gets killed. Um, and yet there seems to be this very strong cultural appreciation for the species in certain tribes around that area. So the question then is, how do we protect that tolerance and how, what could be a threat to it? What social change, what, what aspects might erode that tolerance? How do we protect it? An interesting case that I've become involved in recently is that of fruit bats in Mauritius. So these uh, fruit bats are crop raiders. They, they particularly like lychees and mangoes. And there's this uproar in Mauritius because the species is endangered on the red list, um, but they do crop raid. They also are a nuisance, basically. People don't like these bats because they have misconceptions about bats, but also because um, if you have a house with a large tree in your garden, and at certain times of the year, bats will just descend on that tree and they're extremely noisy, you can't sleep, and uh, they crap all over your yard and everything. So again, at the surface it looks like we'll, we're dealing with a crop issue that might be solved with nets or other protective measures. And you can net these things, I mean you can, you can put 
nets over orchards, you actually have to very meticulously tuck the net in, tie it, the bats very quickly figure out how to crawl in under these and then feast under the net. Um, but when you look at this in, uh, in more detail, and it has recently become extremely political um, uh, and, and more and more complicated conflict because what we now actually have is Mauritian general population having mixed feelings about bats. You have the Mauritian government under pressure from its voters to do something about this and they have repeatedly culled the bats. And then you have the conservation sector absolutely outraged about this, trying to write them government letters and say you mustn't do this, it's an endangered species, etc., etc. And that is having no effect at all. They're just going ahead and culling anyway, because their motivations aren't, uh, well, they're economic and, and uh, voter driven. And so you have this increasing um, division between the parties that are interested in bats. But again, at the surface, you might think this is a cooperating issue, and, but when we did a study to actually figure out what people think about bats, it turns out that, um, that the orchard owners just have the classic NIMBY problem, not in my backyard. They don't care if the bat is uh, a lot, you know, if there are bats in Mauritius or not, but they don't want them cooperating. But the worrying thing is when you ask the general public, we did surveys with people, for example, in markets and, um, and just people who don't have orchards, um, they want them extinct. And this is something I don't often see um, because quite a, usually there's, there's a NIMBY problem across the board. But of course, this now tells us that what we have to do is work with the general public to change how they feel about bats. And that's a completely different strategy to netting orchards. Elephants are such a classic case of human wildlife conflict. I've worked on Asian elephants for a decade or so. And here it's always about fencing and chilies and deterrence and uh, bees and ways to keep elephants away. And there's with extremely mixed results. And so a lot of the debate in this field is around why are fences not working, electric fences. But some fences are working. And so what it actually clearly boils down to is that it's not about the fence, it's about the process that was used to engage people in the construction and the maintenance of the fence. Because what has happened a lot in the past is that either an NGO or the local government has come and built an electric fence and then said, here you go. And then a month or so later, the local community is complaining and saying, your fence isn't working, the elephants have broken through. Because it wasn't made clear who's maintaining this, who owns this, who decided where this fence goes in the first place. And sadly, this has happened a, a lot. And so there's a lot of broken elephant fences out there. Um, this is actually a picture from a project um, we did a while ago in Assam, in northeast India. And you can see this is an extremely simple fence built by the locals. All we did is fund the, uh, the, the actual material, but they not only they built it, but they decided where it should go. They mapped it out. And then we had them figure out how to maintain it. And they came up with a rota system. Every household would take care of three posts once a week. They came up with their own little fund for maintaining it and so on. And so what happened is we actually completely transferred the decision making and the ownership. And for that reason, this fence has actually worked very nicely. Uh, they have had no crop rating in this area for four years. And basically, the, the, what it all came down to is just how you engage the people, not how your fence is built. So what we really want to try and get at is, of course, why do some attempts to mitigate human wildlife conflicts not work? If a fence is not maintained, why is that? What's behind it? If there is a simple solution, a simple practical, you'd be very lucky if there's a simple solution, but why does it sometimes not work, or how would, can we make it effective? And sometimes, Actually, the wrong species is blamed for loss, and we might think that that's for lack of education. It might not be. It might be very deliberate, because you might get much more attention if, for example, you blame a jaguar than if you blame a puma. Authorities might come running straight away and offer you help with your livestock vaccination scheme or something. So almost always there is more at stake than the species involved. Very often the conflicts are embed embedded in issues of wider social change, and very often, especially in the more complex conflicts, 
th there is a history of unresolved dispute. And every time there is an attempt to resolve a conflict and it's done badly or it fails, that just adds to it. It makes it worse. So if we're trying to get at what does it take to understand and mitigate conflicts effectively, um, with a group of people, we've been thinking about this quite a lot, and I'm trying to distill here just the, the main points that I think are probably true over the world over. Um, to make sense of this complexity, some principles that seem to apply over and over again. First are some pitfalls. So one thing I've seen in 20 years all in conflicts in many different species and parts of the world is that very often people designing these conflict mitigations make an oversimplified assumption that if you, re if you address the loss, you will get acceptance of the species or you will reduce the conflict. And of course, we know that that is very often not true. If you look at some of the large cats, especially, for example, in ranching situations, it's not about how many cattle they lose. It's, there are other reasons why they persecute jaggers. And often you have cases where people have lost their only cow but still don't retaliate. It is not consistent at all. And you have cases where there is extreme poverty and just people are, people's lives are at risk from wildlife and yet they aren't retaliating. The second is that um, very, I see this very, very often that people are still designing projects that assume that they need to change attitudes and create awareness and that that will change behaviors. Now, of course, in this group where we have some of the world's experts on human dimensions of conflict, uh, we understand that this, the, things are more complicated than this. But for the vast majority of practitioners, especially who are not from social science background, um, government officials, park rangers, trying to deal with, under pressure to deal with this, there is still this common flaw to oversimplify these things. And to give one illustration of this, um, this graph is actually a case, this, this shows attitudes towards jaggers across 17 locations in Latin America. And the attitudes range. And if you look at um, social norms about the killing of jaggers, um, again, they're all over the map, so immediately see how diverse the situation is across 17 cases of conflict. But if you were to look at this particular case, which is the Pantanal in Brazil, um, you can see that attitudes are really very positive towards jaggers, and the social norm towards killing is extremely negative, and they're complete, it seems completely contra contradictory. These people like to have jaggers, and they like to count them. But um, the thing is that it's different everywhere. It's just all over the place. And yet, so often we're jumping to conclusions that we need to change attitudes or, or one thing or another. The other flaw that uh, I see again and again, especially in project proposals, um, having reviewed a number of, um, from the funding side of, uh, on different grant boards, what people tend to struggle with is, is the link between these assumptions and the outcome you want to, want to achieve. And what we really need to do a lot, lot better is start with the end in mind. What do you actually want to change? What are the subcomponents to changing that? And then what are the activities? The vast majority of pro project proposals I see out there are going the other way around. Um, they're saying we need to change attitudes and reduce livestock, and then somehow we'll get to coexistence. And this logic isn't being cross-checked, and of course that is what you need to do to build a very robust project that will actually get you to um, some step towards coexistence. Another flaw is um, this over-focus on damage interventions. This is especially true in the elephant world. There's an almost obsession with what can we do? Can we use drones, bees, fences, chilies? Um, and it's quite a job to try and steer people away from that thinking and really start to think about the underlying human dimensions. Um, and this, this uh, diagram is, is, I think, the most important thing to grasp. And uh, Francine showed this in her talk yesterday. This is just the absolute basics in any negotiation or dispute resolution theory that you cannot just focus on the substance you have to, um, it is also all about process and relationships and that these three things have to 
uh, work together in probably equal measures. And what we are seeing, especially in the elephant world, is a drastic over uh, focus on substance. Possibly because it's easier or it's immediate, it's something you can deal with straight away. It's dealing with the acute problem. But without good process and relationship building, you can't actually ever solve that pro conflict properly. And so, if we try and think of what are the key principles for making progress in human wildlife conflict, um, one of them, we are talking mostly here about human dimensions, but it is also extremely important to understand the ecological, the spatial, and the behavioral aspects of the species involved. Um, if you do not have an understanding of where elephants need to move, why are they using this path, why are they going here or there, um, what the needs of the species are, you can't really plan on a landscape scale, which is what we need to do once we've done the firefighting. The second is understanding just even the basics of, of uh, human dimensions, human so social psychology. Now, in this audience, there is an extremely high understanding of that. Of course, this is the purpose of this conference, but uh, as I said before, that's not the case uh, among the vast majority of practitioners trying to deal with these things. And so, for them, having all these different theories is a little bit overwhelming. If you see all this stuff and you're actually a park ranger with a biology background, you don't even know where to begin with this stuff. We need to simplify, and that, that might be why a lot of the studies tend to um, focus on attitudes and just oversimplified aspects of the human dimensions. So I think we need to find ways to make this um, essential knowledge more accessible and simpler. And what I keep saying um, to practitioners and also people designing projects is what we really need to do more of is not jump straight into the to resolution, but just spend time at the beginning listening to the situation. Just spend months and months um, not doing anything, but listening to the situation. People have, the local people have already tried things usually, um, and until you uncover some of the layers, you're going to again jump to conclusions and um, design projects that have flawed assumptions. And I think what we need to do, actually, is collectively try and influence funders to allow us this time. Because very often we're under pressure with, say, a three-year project to deliver straight away. And after three years, it's supposed to have solved a conflict or be on the right track to solve. It's, it seems almost impossible. These things take many more years than that. Um, and how can we persuade our donors and funders to allow us six months or one year at the beginning where we're allowed to just observe and understand and then plan the actions? Um, another key principle, of course, is understanding the depth of the conflict. What is really going on? Now, some conflicts are genuinely about resources. There is an elephant cooperating, people living below poverty line, really suffering from this and taking desperate measures to retaliate. When you have that, you can come in with a practical solution that protects lives, protects crops, livelihoods, protects elephants, and you may be able to resolve that, at least for some time. You're lucky if you're dealing with this. Um, some conflicts are more convoluted than that. They are about culture. We see that quite often in ranching communities where, for example, with my Jagger example, you can go ahead and protect the cattle, you can give incentives and all sorts, they're still going to shoot jaggers enough in many cases because the reasons for shooting jaggers aren't about the cattle losses. And then, of course, we have these horrible conflicts about identity, where it's really no longer about wolves or sheep, it's about different parties completely at odds with each other and at war with each other. And this is generally beyond the realm of conservation scientists. When you have dealing with this, you really need to bring in people who have peace building, um, conflict transformation, that kind of background experience. And so, um, how we tend to explain this, and um, you may have seen this before in a few talks, is to think of kind of three levels of conflict. The first being the dispute, where it's just about uh, loss. An underlying conflict, is one where you have the loss, but you also have this recurrence of unsatisfactorily resolved attempts, unsatisfactory attempts, and they, they build expectations and their expectations crash, and so it builds up resentment. 
and it gets more complicated. And then you have the deep-rooted or identity-based conflict, which Francine was talking about yesterday as well, which is you have the losses, you have the building resentment, the history, but then you also have people feeling threatened in their identity and their social values, and then it becomes not about the species anymore. And so really then, one step for the conservation community is to really understand this, but then what on earth do you do about it? And as I said before, when you're dealing with just the resource and dispute level, you can bring in the practical solutions. But you wouldn't do that if you're dealing with an identity-based conflict, because you might actually just make it worse. Um, a fence in an identity conflict isn't going to get you anywhere. And so the underlying conflicts are about relationship building and process, and deep-rooted ones are really about reconciliation and uh, addressing the identity issues. And this is where very often we need to bring in outside help from possibly different sectors. There are ways to quickly spot what you're dealing with other than just your experience of the situation. One of those is the language can be very telling. So people who are um, just dealing with a practical threat will say, you know, we, we have to protect, um, we're not safe here, we need, we need to protect our income and so on. But people who are, who are more towards the bottom of, of this pyramid are using very strong and exaggerated word, words like, and, and a lot of blaming, like your elephants are always damaging uh, our, uh, everything we have and your offense isn't working. And when you have that blaming of these are your elephants, um, then there's something much deeper going on. And actually, I think one of the indicators or one of the objectives in, in these project addressing this should be to change that language. This could be your clue for something having changed. If you've done your job well, that language should change. It should be our elephants, not your elephants. And oh, there's a bat here. Um, the bat conflict that I was describing earlier is at the moment at that sort of underlying level. It is rapidly descending into an identity-based conflict right now because, because the conservation sector and the government are digging into positions they're not talking to each other in a constructive way right now. And we want to very much try and prevent that from happening. So if you have deep-rooted conflicts to deal with, then very often you need a third party, um, an impartial, an outsider possibly, who will have a process for, for opening this up and they will make sure that all the parties are heard and that, that their views are considered valid they will focus on relationships. They, won't, they might even completely avoid t talking about the animal. And they will very carefully look at the history and actually address it and, and talk about unresolved issues. And what they're trying to do is basically take people away from positions. Once you have people completely dug into the position, for example, um, you know, bats must be protected because they are endangered. And you t get them talking about what is this really about, what actually matters to you, then you have um, a possibility for dialogue and some progress. Um, another key principle is that actually you need to make sure to create both value and benefit. And what I mean by that is that sometimes you have situations where people or community inherently value the species for some cultural reason maybe. Um, and sometimes you have situations where they're benefiting from it, maybe in an e economic way, those where you have both are the most stable system. Because if you take away one of these, for example, they are people, a community is just economically benefiting, let's say, from ecotourism or something, but they really do not like the species and they really don't care. The minute that economic source is undermined, of course, the system is no longer, it becomes extremely fragile. The other way around, there is always a tipping point where you might think that elephant is. Um, a, a semi-deity and you can't retaliate against it and it's important in your culture, but there comes a point when you have, you're absolutely desperate and you will go out and poison elephants. So I think what we need to strive for in the sort of bigger picture of what we're trying to achieve is these two things together. I think that is the most stable outcome towards coexistence. Some examples of uh, creating economic benefit. And finally, the process of engagement has to be real. It can't be this sort of consultation. There has to be real co-design and a, almost a transfer of ownership. 
and what uh, it's basically it's process, process, process. Focus on how you are doing it and the relationships you're building in the process of working with people, not so much on the technical details. It is, as I said before, if possible, it's all about spending six months to a year just sitting with them, understanding their worldview, and figuring out how to how to build um, dialogue and a relationship with these people. And so. In the case of our electric fence, for example, I mentioned this before, but what happened is that by letting the communities decide where the fence should go, how it should be built, teaching them how to put it together, they literally did it themselves, they decided how they would maintain it, and they came up with some really nice ideas about little practical problems, like how would they get the cattle through sometimes that they needed to, and, and so on. But what happened there is that not only was it a co-design and a participation, it was much more than that, it was actually transferring power and giving them responsibility. And that shift is what makes it sustainable. That is when you can go away and more or less take away that donor dependence. And we've seen these fences last for year after year after year and other communities starting to copy them. So basically, in the question of what does it take to mitigate uh, human-wildlife conflicts effectively, I would say it is these principles built into very sensible planning and a good project design. We have solid analysis, a solid strategy that, where the logic is carefully tested, obviously good implementation through good relationships on good process on the ground, monitoring, learning, and then you're on a hopefully better path towards achieving those goals. In terms of what needs to happen to achieve some of this, I think the main two next challenges in human wildlife conflict are one, scaling up. We are largely firefighting and for the large ranging species like elephants and carnivores, it's, uh, we have to start moving beyond just saving this village and this bit of protected area, we have to look at the entire landscapes. These, la like the jaggers and the tigers and the elephants, these species are going to roam outside protected areas. We have to look at, we have to zoom out and plan the whole thing. Um, and the second is building capacity in all sorts of different sectors that are dealing with this issue. And I'm thinking of the practitioners on the ground or the government represent representatives who have suddenly been told human wildlife conflict is a huge issue for this country, you have to figure out what to do. And they're at a total loss because they've just been, they haven't got all this background. How do we quickly get them the essentials that they need? And so I suppose this is all about training um, and building networks that practitioners and scientists can talk to each other as much as possible, maybe sub-networks in country or in regions, opportunities to visit each other's projects, learn from each other. And, you know, training can take any shape or form. It can be literally just working with people in the field or, or, or more formal settings. We did a workshop in Bhutan, for example. And then provision of information and also simplifying information because not everybody um, has a science background or doesn't, simply doesn't have time to go through the entire literature of human dimensions and try and figure out for themselves how to tackle these things. And so this is one thing we've done in the, in the Human Wildlife Conflict Task Force. We built this library. I put this up because I'm not sure if um, many people have seen this. It is basically a library of the best readings out there sorted into topics. Um, there's the URL there. But but this is mostly scientific papers, but also guides people. There's a lot of sort of manuals. They're all on here. Um, but also what we're trying to do in the IUCN group is to, uh, well, the, the IUCN has asked us to produce guidelines that capture a lot of what I've presented here, these principles, um, into uh, a guidance document and also into shorter little brief guides that we're working on at the moment, which will be in many different languages. So I leave it there with some contact info on the website if you would like to know more. Thank you.